Welcome to the Human Rights Summit. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Elisa Massimino, President and CEO of Human Rights First. We have a packed day of dialogue ahead of us uh, about some of the most pressing human rights challenges in the world. But before we get started, I wanted to say a few words about who we are and why we're here. The theme of this summit is American Ideals universal values. It was an American, Eleanor Roosevelt, who led the effort to craft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted 67 years ago tomorrow. At Human Rights First, we believe that American leadership continues to be essential in the global struggle for human rights. That's why we press our government to live up to its ideals in its foreign policy and here at home. Because history shows that when the US government puts its principles into practice, it can be an enormous force for progress, bolstering human rights activists and weakening their oppressors. And when the United States falls short, the opposite happens. Tyrants take heart and activists take cover. Some organizations do the essential work of exposing human rights abuses. Others seek progress by naming and shaming those abusers. At Human Rights First, we see our job as creating the political environment and policy solutions needed to ensure consistent and durable respect for human rights. To that end, we form diverse coalitions to build consensus behind policies and initiatives to secure respect for human rights and human dignity over the long haul. And often, it is a long haul. It was more than a decade ago that we assembled a coalition of retired generals and admirals to oppose torture. At the time, a partnership between a human rights organization and a bunch of military leaders was unusual, if not unprecedented. But it was a natural fit, as it turned out, because military leaders know firsthand that our country is stronger and safer when its actions match its values. Over the years, we've worked with that coalition, along with a group of professional interrogators, to promote humane and legal interrogations. Together, we've made important progress. Most recently, President Obama signed a defense bill containing a measure that solidifies the ban on torture. That measure passed the Senate with 78 votes, an unusual bipartisan victory in this polarized environment. To me, that shows that we are making progress, building a durable consensus against this horrific and counterproductive practice. And right now, we're forming strategic coalitions to push the US government to fulfill its rightful role as a safe haven for refugees, teaming up with religious groups, members of the bar, and national security leaders. We're pushing back against the effort to shut the door on persecuted and traumatized Syrian refugees. All that is to say that this summit, which brings together an extraordinarily broad range of advocates, activists, and leaders, isn't a diversion from our day-to-day -day work at Human Rights First. It's an extension of it. As I was reviewing today's agenda, I was struck by how closely related so many of the topics are. The global refugee crisis, the spread of violent extremism, the rise of authoritarianism. These challenges can all be traced, at least in part, to long-standing human rights problems that the world and the United States has not only allowed to fester, but in some cases has perpetuated. Clearly, the current approach is not working. We need a new vision and a new resolve to break with the mistakes that we seem to keep making. And I suspect that today, you'll hear precisely the kind of fresh thinking that our country and our world desperately needs. To kick off our program today, we've asked Nielsen's Harris Poll to present the results of a survey we sponsored to gauge American public opinion on a variety of human rights issues. Here to present the results of the poll is Sarah Simmons, Vice President and Senior Consultant at Nielsen. Sarah has conducted extensive public opinion research for the International Republican Institute and many other associations, companies, and government institutions. She has more than a decade of experience as a pollster and strategic advisor for a number of political campaigns and politicians, including Senator John McCain, former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and she served in the White House Office of Strategic Initiatives during the George W. Bush administration. In addition to her extensive experience providing polling data to American political campaigns, Sarah has done in-depth survey and research in focused group projects internationally in countries as diverse as Turkey, 
Australia, Albania, Malaysia, Mongolia, and New Zealand. In 2007, she was named one of Campaign and Election Magazine's rising stars for people 35 or under who have already made a significant mark in political consulting or advocacy. Please welcome Sarah Simmons. Oops, I forgot my clicker. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. And Nielsen is so pleased to be a part of the summit today that Human Rights First has sponsored. And we're pleased to be um, in the position to present some data about what Americans are thinking about these very important issues. Just a note first on methodology. We, um, the data today comes from two different surveys. And they are both um, in-depth in terms of their size and scope and um, in terms of the timing in which we did the studies. So we were in the field November 12th through the 19th. So some of these questions happened before the terrorist attacks in Paris. And then we went back into the field afterwards to make sure that we had the most up-to-date information after that sort of seminal moment because it impacted a few of the questions that we were asking about. Um, as I mentioned, this is a big survey, so we have the ability to sort of dig deep on some of the key uh, demographic groups that might be of interest to this audience, and we plan to do that as we go through these, this data. So, to set the stage a little bit, the first question we asked about was what issues do we think, do Americans think we're doing enough on as a nation to support um, in the human rights realm? And as you can see, the majority of Americans don't really think we're doing enough on any of the issues that we talked about. 13% say we're providing enough support for Syrian refugees. And that same very small percentage, you know, sort of carries through on some of these top issues, like confronting anti-Semitism, ending slavery. And then there's a little bit more, you know, sense that we're doing enough to support LGBT rights. Um, and as you can see across partisan lines, that level of support is relatively, or that level of, you know, um, understanding that we're doing enough is relatively low across all party lines. So there's, this is an area where there's relative agreement that we aren't doing enough sort of across a wide variety of issues. The next question we asked about is importance. What issues did Americans think that we were providing, were important in the human rights realm? And as you can see, um, there's a, a fair amount of support and importance for eliminating hate crimes and ending slavery and human trafficking, majority support for that. Again, some people, uh, about half said there was enough, uh, it, there's, it, it's important to combat violent extremism and advance women's rights worldwide. And the level of importance kind of uh, decreases after that point. Moving on. We asked a series of questions about um, asking people to see, say whether or not they agree with a variety of statements um, regarding human rights. And what you can see is there's a wide um, and strong sense of agreement for, for these issues. In, interestingly, 82% said companies should be held accountable for um, human trafficking and slavery in their supply chains. That's more than said it was important for the US government to be um, a leader on promoting human rights, though 77% agreed with that statement as well. Um, there's wide, again, wide agreement with these statements in terms of stopping slavery and um, uh, supporting women who, fleed, fl uh, who fled violence in Central America to make sure that they have a fair hearing if they're trying to um, stay here in the US. And a few more statements. I'm having trouble with my clicker. 70% um, said the U.S. should provide leadership for groups um, in other countries who use violence against ethnic and religious communities. And again, wide agreement that the U.S. should press countries that don't do, um, that uh, with authoritarian countries to protect personal freedoms of their citizens. A little bit lower support for saying torture should never be used as an official policy in the U.S., but even still, 64% agree, which is almost two-thirds of the American public agree that that should never be um, an official policy of the U.S. government. In addition to these wide-ranging sort of, you know, 60,000-foot issues, we dug deep on two um, key issues. And the first one we want to talk about is um, support for admitting Syrian refugees to the United States. 
Um, we were, again, as I mentioned before, we were in the field prior to the attacks in Paris and then a little bit after to make sure that we had the most up-to-date information after that sort of seminal moment um, in, 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 with attacks in Paris. And what you can see is that prior to the attacks, 65% said that we should allow some number of Syrian refugees into the U.S. Only 35% said we should say we should allow no Syrian refugees into the country. After the attacks, we sort of saw a a fairly significant shift in those numbers, a 10% increase in those who say we should allow no Syrian refugees into the U.S. And this is one area where we think it's important to point out, you know, very much the partisan differences. Um, you can see among Democrats, the numbers very, changed barely at all. The, you know, the, those who said none went from 23 to 27%, barely a significant, you know, not a significant shift at all in terms of what that data says. But among Republicans and Democrats, you saw a big shift, um, 16 points among Democrats from 47% who said we should have none to 63% saying none in terms of the number of Syrian refugees we should allow into the U.S. And among Democrats that, or among independents, that number went from 35% to 48%. So a pretty significant shift there in terms of um, American public opinion after the Paris attacks. Moving on to the final issue we asked about was um, allowing uh, Guantanamo Bay to remain open or, or sort of the support for closing Guantanamo Bay. And what you see is that the majority say it would actually be um, a good idea for those who have been cleared to be transferred to by national security officials to other countries that have agreed to take them. 65% agree with that. And that support is wide and, and bipartisan in its nature. It's, um, there's no real partisan differences or no, you know, no single party group that's sort of opposed to that. And in addition, um, there's wide support for saying the U.S. government can fight terrorism effectively without continuing to operate a prison at Guantanamo Bay, 52%. So majority agree with that statement. Slightly smaller percentage agree that the federal prison system can effectively and securely house Guantanamo Bay det detainees. These are the issues that we asked about in our survey and that we wanted to present today. And um, I think we want to, Elise wants to make a few comments. Elisa wants to make a few comments about that. And we'll uh, hand the podium back over to her. down with you okay. and we're gonna <coughs> chat and we'll also take some questions from you all um, so thank you so much for that uh, fascinating thanks for doing the poll and uh, and for presenting it um, I, I want there are a few things about it that kind of jumped out to, to me that I wanted to highlight and then I have a couple of questions and we might have some time for questions from the audience as well um, first on the refugee question you know after that horrifying photo of the Syrian toddler, Ilan Kurdi, uh, who drowned and was on the beach in Turkey, uh, was everywhere, um, there was an outpouring, I think, of, of support for humanitarian relief and resettlement of refugees. <clears throat> and then after the Paris attacks, that certainly, at least in this country, with all the overheated rhetoric, has seemed to significantly uh, shift away from dealing with it as a humanitarian issue and, and it, uh, more towards looking at it as a security issue. So I found it really striking and intriguing and I guess encouraging that despite the kind of rhetoric that we've seen um, here in the United States, a majority of Americans still support admitting Syrian refugees for resettlement. That's, I'm gonna ask you some questions about that, but I think that's a, a point worth noting. Um, second is on Guantanamo, which um, I also found a bit encouraging because domestically here it's hard to pick an issue that's been more um, polarized and contentious, and yet 65% of Americans think that the people there um, who've been cleared for transfer ought to be transferred. Um, so there's not a lot of support for, you know, kind of locking that place down and keeping the people who are there, uh, there. And then uh, also interesting that um, a majority of Americans don't see Guantanamo as kind of a, a crown jewel in the counter-terrorism arsenal, um, don't really see it as, as all that necessary, um, even as concerns about terrorism are, are high. So, um, and, and you know, even on this question that you, you pointed out about, um, about the ability of the um, American prison system, the federal prison system, uh, to deal with these uh, detainees, you know, there still seems to be a fair amount of wiggle room there. Um, you know, I think it was 20% of Americans said they, they 
didn't know what they thought really about that. So that maybe provides some opening um, for, for public education around uh, the capacity of our institutions to deal with these challenges in a way that comports with our values and our laws. And then third, of course, this is um, uh, music to my ears, the fact that so many, such a high percentage of Americans um, believe that the United States is not doing enough to advance serious human rights issues. That's something, as the leader of an organization <laughs> who believes in American leadership and the importance of American leadership, uh, it's certainly something that I believed, but it's nice to see um, that Americans, um, contrary to some of the rhetoric that we hear um, about, you know, kind of hunkering down and isolationism, really believe that their government ought to be doing more and ought to be leading globally on these issues. Those are the, the three things that I thought were kind of most important takeaways uh, for us and informative of, uh, for us. Um, so I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. W one is um, just if we could talk a little more about the kind of pre and post uh, Paris attack yeah. questions on, on, on refugee protection and, and maybe get a little bit more granular. How does that break down? Yeah, so it, it, we were in the field, um, as I mentioned, the 19th, and the events in Paris happened on November 13th. So as we were getting the data out of the field, we were looking at those numbers, and we immediately thought, gosh, this is, this is not going to be um, as relevant as, as it ought to be. So we you know, went pretty much immediately back into the field with that question to ask it again and to make sure we had a really good picture of what was going on. Um, and I agree with you. I think it's important to note that Democrats and, and independents, both a majority, both of those groups think that we should allow some Syrian refugees in. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> I can project to the back of the room, but the poor people in front, right? <laughs> um, so I, I think that that is really compelling to think about the fact that for Democrats and independents, there is a majority support for allowing those people in. And the, the change among Republicans, I think, um, you know, you hit on something about some of the, the press coverage and some of the rhetoric. Certainly, I think that those things impact um, public opinion. Did the Paris attacks uh, change Americans' opinions about human rights overall? Well, you know, that first question we asked, the sort of table-setting question about whether or not people thought we were doing enough as a, as a country to support human rights issues, those numbers changed virtually not at all through um, from one survey to the next. So we repeated that question as well, just to see if there was sort of a, if that explosive, um, you know, of an incident sort of changed how public opinion was shaking out sort of overall on the sort of 60,000 foot look at the issues. And no, what you see there is 20% of the people say they're unsure about what we're doing on issues. 20% say we're not doing enough on any issue. And then those very small percentages of people saying, yes, we're giving enough support to these variety of issues. Where, where did you find the most bipartisan agreement, and where, where is there the biggest divide? Well, what I thought was interesting is that on those statements about um, the big sort of 60,000 foot station statements, should, should the U.S. be a leader on these issues? Should companies be held responsible? On virtually all those issues, it was more than three quarters of people who agreed with those statements. So I think the bipartisan support across sort of conceptually what, what your organization is looking at in terms of human rights and what we should be doing as a nation, what companies should be held accountable for. There was bipartisan support at really high levels, which I think, you know, in, in kind of today's environment, that's fairly rare. Yeah, I find that really, I, I find that really fascinating. Um, what do you think, in terms of the, um, the numbers of people who think that the U.S. government is doing enough to advance human rights, um, and that those numbers are pretty low. Uh, um, what lessons do you think we can draw from the data about the kind of room there is for public conversation about human rights issues, how much potential support there might be for policy change on human rights? Because that's often viewed as sort of a, a huge uphill climb, especially here in this town. Well, I think the dialogue is something that certainly um, there's a lot of space for. As I mentioned, there's 20% of people who just say they're unsure what we're doing on human rights issues. So that's a whole group of people who just, you know, education and the dialogue can certainly impact sort of their opinion about what we are doing and where we maybe need to be expending more effort. I also think it's interesting that on that question, there was wide bipartisan agreement about where we're doing enough and more, maybe more on the other side of the equation that we're not doing enough across most of those issues. So there wasn't... Um, 
you know, so often in uh, around sort of policy issues in the U.S. today, you do see these sort of big swings. You know, 100% of Republicans think that, and 0% of Democrats, you know, <laughs> think the same thing. It's not like that at all on these issues. It's sort of it's low level of agree, you know, low level that we're doing enough on any of those issues. So I think that does open the space for this kind of an event and these this kind of dialogue. So. Right, so the high number, like I think it was 77% of Americans think that we ought to be, that the U.S. ought to be leading on human rights in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, as you say, cutting across uh, um, political um, party affiliation, that strikes me as an extremely high yeah. percentage of agreement on anything. I mean, if you had to, add, you know, if you asked just what, what would you pick where there would be 77% 77 of Americans agree on X in this environment, it's hard to come up with something. Um, but the fact Puppy that- dogs and rainbows, yeah. right? Like a, <laughs> True, although even there, I don't know, unicorns. I don't, um, uh, so, but um, what, do you, what do you make of that, that number? And what do you think that means for, for us and the people concerned about advancing human rights. Well, I think I think that it's rare to find a political issue that you do see that, an issue that is in the political space, right, that is policy related where there is that much agreement. And I think what that that does give you permission to do is, is to talk about those issues. And certainly I think what you will find is that Americans are supportive. I noticed that there was um, a, you know, we talk a lot about the U.S. government, but there was a question about American companies yeah. in, in the poll. And um, that there was a high level of agreement that companies ought to be held accountable for human rights in their supply chains, specifically forced labor. Do you have any insights from the data about um, how that might support action on the corporate side and how it compares to what Americans expect of their own, of their own government? Well, I think I thought that was a really outstanding, you know, interesting point in the data as well. Eighty-two percent said companies should be held accountable for sort of slavery and human trafficking in their in their um, supply chains, compared to seventy-seven percent who said U.S. the U.S. should be a leader on these issues. Right, so a higher percentage agreed with that, and it was bipartisan. So I think. What I think is that that points to this as being a top of mind issue and certainly something that's gonna impact corporations and how you know, consumers are possibly making decisions and all of those you know, kinds of issues that sort of impact um, how American consumers and American voters are thinking about these issues. For us, that's really important because I think when, you know, if you think about how the world experiences American leadership, um, a lot of that comes from the power of, uh, um, you know, global brands that are uh, that emanate from American companies, and and so you know, in some places, it's probably more influential than U.S. government policy, depending. So that I I find that a really fascinating. Um, so let me turn it over to all of you, and uh, I'm going to shield my eyes from the spotlights here and see if anybody has any questions for. Sarah about the poll. Um, don't be shy. I know that it's early. Yeah. So, um, figure of 20% um, had no opinion. Could you speak a little bit more about that, um, knowing that polls often don't reveal how much people really don't know about an issue? That would be That would be interesting to Great. Yeah, and could you identify yourself too? Yeah, Aunt Heyman. Thank you. So I, I think that's a really interesting point. And when, <coughs> what we see when we, you know, we do research across a wide variety of policy issues and sort of, you know, this public policy space. And what I think is maybe sort of the contrary point to the fact that 20% don't know is that 80% were able to offer an opinion. So most of the public really was able to offer an opinion. And what we see when we worry about that issue that maybe people just aren't informed enough to answer the question, what we see is, you know, weird response rates and the survey doesn't work right. And we didn't see that in this case. It was just more that people didn't have enough information to rate any one issue as something we were doing enough. So what I think that means for Human Rights First is that there is a lot of space for the dialogue and there is certainly a part of the public that needs information and certainly needs education. Great, that's part of why we're here today. So, um, anyway, uh, way in the back there. Yep, you. Hi, from World Learning. 
I'm curious about the results um, concerning support for American leadership on human rights issue. Did your survey give you any, any indication to what extent that is support for advocating human rights governments and to what extent that might be changes in America's approach to our own human rights issues in terms of you know, essentially walking the talk on leadership? That's a question I think is a little bit beyond the scope of the questions we were asking, but I think if you look at the variety of questions we asked about US leadership, I think it's clear that Americans think um, <coughs> we should be a leader on promoting human rights, you know, that we should respect, you know, we should look for our allies to respect women, you know, we should be looking at stopping slavery um, and human trafficking, you know, and I do think we asked a couple questions sort of about um, more what the US policy is, certainly about Central Americans fleeing to the US and sort of allowing fair trials for those folks. There was 72% agreement and majority agreement across party lines for that. So, you know, that's one area where I think if you're talking about domestically walking the walk, where we did ask a question and saw, you know, sort of wide support for that. Um, but most of the questions that we asked were sort of focused on our role sort of in the greater world. And Elise, I don't want to get into too many policy points, so if there's more that you want to add to that. No, I think, you know, for, um, for us, it, and I think for anybody, it's, it's obviously the, the strongest leadership is leadership by example. And um, when it's, I think when it's clear to the world that we're grappling with our own challenges here, and the more we're addressing those and doing, them in a, doing that in a responsible way, it certainly um, adds momentum to uh, our capacity to lead internationally. Um, that's why it's so important, I think, for us to be, you know, looking at the problems that we have here at home, of which there are many, being honest and humble about those as we, as we talk, um, but not saying um, that because we're not perfect, we can't advance the uh, ideals and values um, enshrined in the Universal Declaration um, abroad and, and call out governments that are violating those, but at the same time we have to grapple with, with the challenges that we have here. And I think when we do that, we're much more effective as a nation in leading uh, the world to a better place. Okay, we have time maybe for one more question if anyone's got a burning issue, and it doesn't look like maybe we do. Um, so I'm going to say thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, a great presentation and um, and for doing this poll. And uh, maybe we can make it an annual thing. Yeah, that so would we be can great. Track the changes. We were really pleased to partner with you guys on this, and, and very pleased to be a part of your presentation today. Perfect. Thank you. We'll be right back. Don't go away.